going to be in Luke chapter 9. Boy, uh, Rachel, you chose some wonderful songs, and we didn't know that Linda's dear daddy was going to be with the Lord celebrating this morning, but uh, I thought the words to the songs you chose were wonderful and perfect, and uh, my, my heart was breaking as I was giving Linda a hug and Ashley a hug, and uh, I don't like it when anybody in the church loses a parent. Uh, and yet, so glad that I've met your parents and to know that they're wonderful Christian people that love the Lord. And that matters more than anything else right now. Brothers and sisters, the gospel matters. Eternity matters. Get right with Jesus. Make sure all your friends and family are right with Jesus because this day is coming and you don't want to face it without the cross. Today's message, Winning the Cosmic Lottery, or How to Win the Cosmic Lottery. <clears throat> Yet again today, uh, week after week, I, I uh, often wish that Christ gave me the kinds of met, met, the type of material that would get us a really giant church. <laughs> uh, you know, the kind of stuff that everybody's going to like me for and uh, be so glad I delivered that nice, easy, comfortable message. Christ is an odd character in that he uh, is calling the entire world to him at the same time, he's saying things that are very difficult to swallow. I can, I'm so convicted reading the words of Christ, and uh, it's so difficult for me to deal with this text. And then I'm yet again supposed to come around and, and deliver hard, challenging words from Christ that people just don't want to hear. Uh, it's another one of those sermons that are just not recommended if you ever want to go into politics or or draw large groups of people around you that bring lots of people and lots of money. This is a hard message to hear. And it's not my job to, make the, to take the edge off of Christ's words so that they're, they're less impacting. It, it, it's not the job for pastors or Christians, any of us, to, to feel like we have to translate Christ's words to society so that they're not as difficult or offensive, repellent, as they originally were. Uh, Christ drove people from him. Many people heard the message of Christ and they went the other direction. This is a hard message to give, as I said, and I want to just say up front, Jesus is the only one who ever lived life as it should be lived. Uh, it really... We can never put pastors, uh, brothers and sisters not even, you know, the Pope or Mother Trees. We can't put anybody on a pedestal. Only Christ has lived the kind of life. He only, he's the only one who lived life the way it should be lived. And if I try to appear to be something I'm not while well, I'm up here, as if I finished the race, uh, I'm a hypocrite. And so I do not want to do that. I got, a, I got enough going on without piling on hypocrisy to the list, uh, although we all struggle with it. I am a debtor to grace, and I say that with pride because I can't take pride in anything else. I'm a debtor to grace. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I stand with Christ, and he lets me stand with him. Sometimes I'm such a fool, I'm ashamed to stand with Christ. Wait, Dan, haven't you been a pastor, youth pastor, assistant pastor, missionary? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I still have to pray, Lord, help me to preach boldly as I should. Lord, these folks are under the mistaken idea that maybe I'm cool. Lord, as soon as I talk, they're going to know I'm not. Lord, let me stand with you. You know what? He should be ashamed of me, but he's not because he loves me. There's no way we should ever be ashamed of our Lord. I stand with Christ not because of uh, 
anything within me, but because he's so good, he lets me stand next to him. It's kind of like uh, Reggie White after he won the Super Bowl, and Bears and Eagles fans, I know you love this, and he was, uh, after the Packers won the Super Bowl, and his, he was running around with his son on his shoulder, and he had his son with him. You know, the other cute thing about that was after the Super Bowl, Reggie was up there being interviewed and said, one more is not enough. We're going to get one more. We're going to win again next year. And his son, who loved and idolized his dad, was sitting on his lap. He went like this, looked at his dad. And he's saying to the camera, as his dad's talking, no, no, my dad's a good man. He's not greedy. We're content with just one. <laughs> and I was so blessed by that little boy trying to defend his dad on national television. My dad's not greedy. but I get to stand with Christ because he's my heavenly father and he called me. Give me your stand with me. Nothing I deserve. In uh, fact, uh, God is awesome. God is wise. God is good. As for myself, apparently it's true that opposites attract. Right? Isn't that what we got to say? Thank you, God, that you love us despite ourselves. So we're not going to come to church and ever put on false faces. This is not a place where we go to pretend we're better than we are, pretend we're something that we're not. We are in debt to the grace of Jesus Christ. We love the Jesus Christ because he first loved us. And he's done so much for us. And I just want to hold on. I never want to let go, but I'm just happy that his grip is stronger than mine. All right, let's, uh, let's get into it. Let's read uh, Luke chapter 9. Eighteen through twenty-three. We read eighteen uh, from verse eighteen last week. We're going to do a little bit of repeating. Luke nine eighteen through twenty-three, and uh, I want to ask you this question: Are you afraid? As Yoda said, "You will be. <laughs> you will be. Uh, we should be terrified in the presence of the Lord." And when Jesus starts doing what he does, that whole Jesus thing, the God thing, where he thinks he has the right to just dictate to our lives, it gets scary real fast. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others that you are one of the prophets of long ago come back to life. Now the Jewish people didn't believe that the prophets were active. John the Baptist was a startling thing in their midst. And now the Jewish people, even the ones that don't understand who he is, even many that will later reject him, Christ's life is so powerful, the miracles that he's doing are, are so evident, his teaching is so profound, that everybody says he's a prophet, right? Like we knew about from hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago in our, in our history, our Jewish history. So they said the crowds say you're either John the Baptist who popped back up or you're Elijah, one of the other prophets from long ago. And Jesus said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Because as big as being a prophet is, Jesus is saying this is bigger than that. And Peter answered, you are God's Messiah. You are the Savior. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone because Jesus is on his own time scale here. He's going to determine when and where he dies. Uh, and he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And remember, we've talked before that prophecy is sometimes difficult before it happens. But the thing about prophecy is when it happens, and you can say, oh yeah, now I understand. In the Old Testament, there's prophecy about this victorious king who's coming to set the world right and to rule from Israel. There's this also this prophecy about a savior who would come and suffer for his people, a suffering servant. How could both of these be true? And, and, and so some Jewish people are saying there's going to be two different messiahs. Well, that's a reasonable conclusion from the perspective of the Old Testament alone, before, you know, B.C., before Christ. How could these both be true? Uh, now we see that both of them about Christ, and he was coming first as a servant who would die for our sins, and he's coming back as a victorious king. But, but we have both of these themes going through there, and Jesus says, I must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders this is to, fill, to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Then he said to them all, and here's where it gets difficult, 
because he's talking about himself. Okay, yeah, we're all with him here. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, uh, and follow me. Now, sometimes people uh, want to dodge the bullet here. You know, what do we call it? The Holy Spirit dodge? Holy Spirit's coming right for you, and what do you do? Ole! Whew, was not convicted this Sunday. Uh, <laughs> right? Sometimes we're trying to avoid conviction. I, I see a lot of people are tight just because of the verse we just read. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. We're Americans. We don't like to deny ourselves. We like to indulge. I like steak. You know what I like more than a steak? Two steaks. <laughs> I'm just saying it as it is. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Wow. Now, this is before Jesus actually went to the cross. He, he, what he means here is this pole that you carry on your back, this pole of burden here, but it, it was the pole that the Romans used to crucify people on. Take up your cross and then follow me. Well, that is terrifying. I wanna, if you're not fr afraid yet, I want to ask you, where did Christ go? Where did he go? To the cross giving his life to love other people. Almost all of the people that were with him, all of the disciples that heard this, also ended up dying for their faith. Now, I don't think we can extrapolate out of, all, out of this that every Christian dies for their faith. That's not the case at all. Very few are called to what may be, in some sense, a blessing, uh, that sense of martyrdom. But we're all called to deny ourselves, to pick up this cross and to follow him in this self-denial, in order to love and bless other people, even though it may cost us dearly, is a very painful thing. Sometimes people read this and they try to say, well, he's just talking to his apostles, and i got to tell you, boy, uh, I don't think so. And this is the heart of God anyway, and he's applying this idea, a disciple. And so then other people say, well, there's a difference between somebody who's saved and somebody who's a disciple. There may be something to that, but I think we delve into that way too much. And then we say, well, I want to be one of the 95% that is just saved. Whew, and I can go on with my life and not care about the heart of Jesus. Because I don't consider myself a disciple. I'm not sure that in Christ's mind there was a big difference between a follower and a disciple. But the one, one who followed the rabbi and one who followed the rabbi. He's saying to his followers self-indulgence, selfishness, self-righteousness, all this self, we got to set it aside. And there's going to be difficult things, including the scorn and rejection of possibly a husband, a wife, family members, parents, children who can't understand why mom and dad are loving Jesus anymore all of a sudden, neighbors, friends, family, co-workers who laugh at you, derision of the world, Heaped upon us because we follow Christ. That's a cross to bear. And then he says, follow me. In the places Jesus goes, eventually we're told Jesus Christ went to, to hell to preach there. Uh, I don't know what that means. I know that's when Christ says, follow me, he may take us to the very doorstep of hell to share the gospel. He may take us to some dark, scary places to shine the light of Jesus Christ. He may take us to places that's God-forsaken. You say, why do I want to be in a God-forsaken place? And God says, because I haven't forsaken it, and I need a witness here. These people are living a dark, hopeless life. I need somebody to bring the gospel. I would go. You're mine. Follow me. Are you scared yet? Jesus wants to mess up your life. That's why everybody hates him. C.S. Lewis called him the great interferer. I've got my plans, and I'm going to pray for a blessing on my plans. And God says, I want you over there doing this, and it's going to cost you. <laughs> See, I told you. I warned you that this is not the kind of message that we give just so we can grow. Uh, let me correct that. This is the kind of message we give so that we can grow. Perhaps not always numerically. Christ 
challenged us with this message because he thought, evidently, God in flesh thought this is a message his people need to hear. Christ makes it difficult to be a witness to him, doesn't he? Let's think about this a little more. Where did Christ go? Well, first, where did he leave? He left the comfort, the glory, the beauty, the wonder of heaven to step down into earth. I don't know if I can be a missionary because I'm awful comfortable in James, Wisconsin. I don't know if I can give up my, my Thursday evenings to go to Bible study because Gilligan's Island is on Thursday evenings. I don't know if I can do this or do that. He left heaven because he was so much in love with us and he wanted to save us from ourselves, save us from death, save us from our sins, save us from hell. And then he says, follow me, let's go get some more. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved me, but I've got a remote and a comfortable chair. He left a place where everybody gave him honor and appreciation to a place where so many people spit on him, scorned him, rejected him, mocked him. Do you want to go from where you're appreciated to where you are not appreciated? I'm not made of strong enough stuff for that. And yet, he calls us to deny ourselves, to follow him. Jesus went behind enemy lines. It's like an undercover agent, like, like James Bond on a rescue mission. He goes behind enemy lines. He's coming into a world that is held captive by sin and death. The Bible says that Satan is the god of this world. Satan, this world is a place of, of sickness, of sorrow, of tears, of backbiting, of bitterness, of ego, of one-upsmanship, of, of, of vampirism. You know what I mean by being a vampire, right? We use other people to build ourself. We just see other people as a means that I can get something for myself. That's what being a vampire is all about. Jesus went into this world in order to save those who would listen, in order to seek and to save the lost. And he went humble. How humble did Jesus come? He had his diapers changed. I'm not, I'm not built of stern enough stuff. And yet, Lord, facing humiliation where everybody thinks I'm a joke, just to save that one person, that family, those friends who will listen? In eternity, do I think I'm going to regret sharing the gospel? And yet, so hard to stand for Jesus at work, at school, in your neighborhood. Brothers and sisters, he should be ashamed of us. He's not because he loves us. We should never be ashamed of him. He left heaven. He went on a rescue mission. He came humble. He endured rejection, scorn, mockery. He endured hatred by the people he loved. As he tried to bless them, they said, you're of Satan. That's bad. Listen, I gave up so much <coughs> just trying to help you beatings, whippings. He went where it was guaranteed that he would be rejected, scorned, uh, beaten, mocked, and hated. Not going to the mission field may be facing rejection. Not sharing your faith with your friends that maybe they're going to laugh at you. But it was guaranteed these things would happen. You know what? Kind of like being a Christian on some college campuses in America. <laughs> guaranteed to face some ridicule. And yet, brothers and sisters, let's stand for Jesus. Can we do that? Well, with his power, not with our own. <laughs> let's stand for Jesus. Let's share the love of Jesus. Let's share this cross, not bringing hatred and condemnation. I couldn't stand before the condemnation of God. Why do I want to heap it on other people? But I want to warn them that the wrath of God is coming on unrighteousness. Turn, repent, get right with Jesus, and everybody can go to heaven because of the cross of Christ, if we would humble ourselves, open up our heart, and accept this free gift that he is offering. 
Eventually, Christ went to the cross, laying down his life to save others. So see, we might not die on a Roman cross. Unlikely, there's no Roman Empire anymore. But we still may end up laying down our life to be a blessing to other people. How many times have you thought, I have a right to retaliate? Ooh, did you see what she said about me? I have a right to. Or do you see the way my husband treated me? I have a right to. Wait a second. I think we gave up our rights when we were bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I think it's about his agenda and not my agenda. And part of denying myself means giving up the, what I think is the right to be bitter, the right to hold a grudge, the right to pout, the, the right to, to, you know what? You and I are not the wrath of God. That's not our spiritual gift. Our spiritual gift is not sarcasm. It's not the wrath of God. Our spiritual gift is, 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 is not putting people in their place. Uh, we gave up our rights when we came to Christ, and now it's all about his plans for our life. He says, follow me, and we need to be like him more and more, laying down our lives to be a blessing to others. And Jesus is going into dark places, and he turns around to see who's walking with him, and he says, come and follow me. And I want to answer, yes, Lord, and I want to run. Why walk? When Jesus is going someplace, why would I stroll? Why would I hold back? Let's run. Let's run to share the gospel. Let's run to bless people. Let's run to love people. And I'm preaching to myself. Three things, three mind-bogglingly, and I almost didn't put that word in there because it's difficult to say bogglingly. Uh, <laughs> Three mind-frying, difficult things that Christ has the audacity to demand of us. What, how audacious that he demand these things of us. Deny yourself. Well, who are you to tell me that? Who do you think you are? Take up your cross. You mean suffer? Why? My life is kind of designed around avoiding suffering. Follow me. I'm going to follow you. Where are you going? McDonald's? Okay. Bowling alley? Maybe. Where are you going? Oh, wow. Don't think I'm up for that. Jesus is not playing. He's not playing around. Deny yourself. Say no to your flesh. You want to pout? You can't. Dan. No pouting. Deny yourself. You do not have the route to, to hold a pity party for yourself. Deny yourself that privilege. You want to hold a grudge? Deny yourself. You want to really unleash a tirade of words, and you just got the perfect zinger. Boy, I got to say this. I'm going to deny yourself. Say no to your flesh. You want to give people the cold shoulder? I'm going to be... So, I was going to say tsumitai, that's a Japanese word. I'm going to be so cold to these people, I'm not going to show them love and affection. I'm not going to show them. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. And you know what? Here's the beauty of it. Here's the wonder of it. When we find ourselves denying ourselves, we actually find ourselves enjoying life more. Isn't that weird? When I give up the right to all of this darkness and garbage, I can't stand to admit that I was out of line as a pastor, as a friend, as a, as a dad, as a husband. I know I need to apologize, but I can't bear the thought. Anyways, that person's no more righteous than me. They were at fault too, right? Okay, Dan, deny your ego. Deny yourself. Go make it right. What does God want you to do? What does God want me to do here? Sit around and wait for the other person to grow up so they're worthy of my apology? not the way it works. Pick, pick up your cross daily. A cross to bear, a challenge, a sin, a difficult situation. I think this is something we can properly extrapolate as an application from this passage. But again, probably what Christ had in mind in this context, he's talking about scorn and rejection of human beings. But it's definitely a proper application to what is your cross to bear? What is your sin? What is it that you struggle with? Is it a marriage that's difficult? You can't just walk away. You can't throw it away. Maybe that's your cross to bear, an uh, un, un, unthankful, ungrateful spouse. Uh, maybe it's, it's an illness that just will not go away. Pick up your cross, bear it in a way that's going to bring glory to Jesus Christ. 
uh, financial trouble. I, I don't know. There's so many different applications. Again, Christ is probably talking about the cross as, as a symbol of for scorn and rejection of human beings, but we can extrapolate a lot of things that we need to bear up with, carry, uh, suffer with, endure in a way that would bring glory to Jesus Christ. So it's okay to think of crosses we struggle with, temptations, maybe like alcoholism, coming from a broken family. That wasn't your fault. And yet, for the rest of your life, you got to deal with that. Poverty, a disability or illness. And I, would, I think viewing these trials as crosses actually can be useful. But let's not minimize what Christ is getting at here. If we follow him, brothers and sisters, if you follow Jesus, it's not maybe some people are going to look down at you. Some people will look down at you. So what's more important, your ego or their soul? Because we've got to be willing to sell, sell the gospel, share the gospel, even when it means some people are going to look down at us. I don't like that, but I do it. Why? Because well, it's right. It's what God has called us to. And love is better than pride anyways, isn't it? Love is better. If we follow Jesus, he said, we're not greater than our master. Did people reject Jesus? Big voice. Did people reject Jesus? Yes. Is he your master? Yes. He said people are going to reject you too. We don't always get to be popular when we talk about Jesus. Follow Christ anyway, though none may follow, still I will follow. The InterVarsity Bible background commentary puts it this way. In rhetorically strong terms, Jesus describes what all true disciples must be ready for. If they follow him, they must be ready to face literal scorn on the road to eventual martyrdom, for they must follow to the cross. From the moment of faith, believers must count their lives forfeit for the kingdom. Let's put that on our sign. The moment you follow, from the moment you follow, follow Christ, count your life forfeit for the kingdom. In other words, what am I here for? I'm here for the kingdom. What am I living for? I'm living for the kingdom. And when I die, I hope I go out in a way that brings glory to Jesus Christ in the kingdom. I don't have the right to be a grouchy old man in, in the nursing home being mean to everybody. Even on my way out, I should be leading people to Christ. Why waste our lives? Why does Jesus command us to deny ourselves, well, because we could choose to indulge ourselves, and I know this from personal experience. We could choose to be full of ourselves, and I often am. We could choose to be all about our own agenda instead of his, and it's to my shame, and I'm not bragging about it, that too often I have to, Holy Spirit, thank you for reminding me of what's important in life. And sometimes death of a loved one reminds us what's really important. Jesus tells us to pick up our cross because we could choose to avoid it, right? Sometimes I think when we say, I knew it was God's will because it was an open door, and I don't know, sometimes I think he calls us to break down some doors, to go through some difficult places, to, to break through the castle wall, to charge through the briar bush, just because it's easy doesn't mean it's God's will. We're too, we, we should not equate God's will with what's easy. That's really unbiblical. We could choose to avoid the cross and maybe seek pleasure, maybe comfort, a life of ease. I think that's kind of naturally our bent. And why does he tell us to follow him? Because he's the shepherd and the sheep are lost without him. I'm lost without Christ. I need to keep my eyes on the Savior. When I lose sight of Jesus, I lose sight of the direction for my life. I want to follow the shepherd's voice. Jesus said in John 10, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Jesus says, Come and follow me. Are we going to follow him? And like his disciples, we should reply, Jesus, you have the words of life. Where else could we go? 
C.S. Lewis quote, uh, said, God created things which had free will. That means creatures which can go wrong or right. Some people think that can imagine a creature which, has, which was free but had no possibility of going wrong, but I can't. If a thing is free to be good, it is also free to be bad, and free will is what made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Now, God didn't do everything free will, right? There's ants, there's dogs, there's a lot of things that just run on instinct. So why did God give free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of automata, of creatures that work like machines, would hardly be worth creating. Here I take exception because he did create rocks and trees and ants and whatnot, but... The happiness which God designs for his higher creatures, here's where Lewis is going, is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other in an ecstasy of love and delight compared with which the most rapturous love between a man and a woman on this earth is, mil milk and w is mere milk and water. And for that, they've got to be free. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. Apparently, he thought it was worth it. If God thinks this state of war in the universe is a price worth paying for free will, that is, for making a real world in which creatures can do real good or harm and something of real importance can happen, instead of a toy world which only moves when he pulls the strings, then we may take it as worth paying. Where am I getting with this? If your faith costs you nothing, you're not doing it right. Christ thought that this state of universe in the war, that God thought that people actually using their free will to reject him was worth enduring for the joy of the love between people and the Lord when we're united with him. It's worth it all. It is worth it all. This is important to remember when he's calling us to deny ourselves, when he's saying, take up your cross and go. God thought that all this hardship was worth it all. And, and, and I really believe that. With everything inside of me, I think no matter what happens to me in this life, the moment I step into heaven and breathe that air that's more pure than anything I've ever breathed before, and all my selfishness and hard-headedness and this orniness is just washed away from me for good, and I look into your eyes and I look into the Lord's eyes and there's nothing behind the veil. It's just without guile, just innocent. And I see the green fields and the blue skies of heaven. I don't believe that I'm going to say, well, that wasn't worth it. Any hardship, any pain, any suffering we endure, we're going to say it was worth it all when we enter the presence of our good Savior. Brothers and sisters, there are things you can do here on earth that you can't do in heaven. For example, sin, right? You can't sin in heaven. In heaven, we can't evangelize. Why is that, Pastor? Well, because everybody else is already saved, right? That's why they're in heaven. And listen, one of the ways we show love for one another like a dad going to work when he's tired, like a mom working her fingers to the bone for the family. We endure hardship. We suffer in order to show other people our love for them. You're not going to be able to show that to the Lord in heaven. If you want to show him your love by going through a miserable month, year, decade, show your love for Jesus by going through that and saying, I just want to honor you in this. I just want to bring you glory in this. I just want people to see you're real as I go through this. Because when I get to heaven, I'm not going to be able to love you in that way. Right now is our chance to show our love to Jesus by enduring hardship. And think of what God is asking you to do. Think of what he did for us. He says, deny your selfish nature. It's not doing you any favors anyway, right? When did selfishness work for us? Suffer for me, he says. Show your love for me, even if it hurts. Jesus says, you don't need those things. I can be your everything. Experience hardship with me because you think I'm worth it. Because that's what I've done for you. Because I thought you were worth it. You are worth the price I paid. You are worth it for me. Am I worth the price to you? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. We'll walk together. Isn't it worth it? You don't need those things. Jesus said, I can be your everything. Let's look at Luke chapter 9, 24 through 27.
What time do we have? I never ask this question. What does that mean? About, is that about where I finish? Okay, I'm just going to finish up a little more and then skip the second half of my message. All right. All right, uh, from verse 23 again. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What? What was that? Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. In other words, if we focus on just me, 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 we'll end up, there'll be no happiness there, there'll be no peace there, we'll have a miserable life, uh, we'll miss everything. But whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and, let, and yet lose or forfeit their very self or their very soul? I said this message about winning the cosmic lottery. What if you win the lottery big time and you get a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars? Let's say you're the best businessman on the earth and you end up owning everything and everybody. And then you're 88 years old and you die in your sleep. What has that done for you if you miss Jesus? What good is it to get... See, we think if I just get this, a vacation home, if I, if I just get this... I just want to go a summer without allergies. You know, if I get this, if I get that, you know, a single man, if I get this gal. We think if I just get this then, and Christ saying, you could get the whole world. And if you miss me, you've missed everything. Who does he think he is? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life must lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will save it. He's obviously not your sociology teacher or your math teacher. Because if they're talking like that, there's a problem. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their very soul? Whoever is ashamed of me, in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and the holy angels, there's a lot, shame has kept a lot of people from coming to Christ, from humbling themselves. No, I'm worried about how people think of me. No, I'm worried about how I'll think about myself and never bowing the knee to Jesus. Truly, I tell you, uh, some who are standing here will not taste death until they see uh, the kingdom of God. And there's some debate whether that means when uh, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, maybe it means when Christ returned, uh, maybe it meant when he died on the cross or when he rose from the dead. It's, it's hard to know uh, exactly what that means. Uh, Matthew Henry, a theologian and pastor born in 1662, wrote, listen to this, this idea of save your life, you lose it, lose your life, you save it. It is well or ill with us according as it is well or ill with our souls. The body cannot be happy if the soul is miserable. But the soul may be happy though the body is greatly afflicted and oppressed in this world. Isn't that interesting? So take care of your attitude, your soul. Because if your soul is right with the Lord, we can find peace. We can find joy no matter what difficult situation, which situation we find in. But if your soul is miserable, it doesn't matter how blessed your physical self is. There will be no joy there. And then he goes on to say, we must never be ashamed of Christ and his gospel. We find our lives when we give them away for Christ. I know it's true. I've experienced it time and time again. Yet my flesh, my old man, my sinful nature uh, is not convinced. Uh, 928 there. Uh, we're going to end. Okay, the, uh, I was building up to what happens next week. So, <laughs> so who does he think he is? Why does he have a right to say these things to us? Uh, same bat time, same bat channel next week. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Dear precious God, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for calling us to a life that's bigger 
uh, than our own. Thank you, Lord, for giving us purpose and meaning, hope and joy. Father, I pray that all of us in this room, myself included, will learn to keep our eyes on you, that we're not filled up with pouting and bitterness and regrets, that we're not always thinking about what we don't have, Lord, but that you are our everything, that you are all we need, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes firmly on you, to hold on tight and to never let go. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for this church, and thank you for this time we could be together. For all this in your name, amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.